Hello and welcome to the Breaking Muscle Podcast. I'm your host, Tom McCormick, and today I'm joined by Calvin from Awesome Fitness Science. Calvin is a trainer, online coach, and writer based in Southern California. He does a fantastic job of breaking down the science on training and nutrition and delivering it in an easy to understand and actionable format. In this special episode, we discuss in detail exactly how you should manage your return to training in the gym after the COVID lockdown. Give it a listen take notes, and you'll be able to map out exactly how you should be training after the layoff. So without further delay, it's on with the podcast. All right, guys, as I just said in that introduction, I'm delighted today to be joined by Calvin. Calvin, thanks for taking the time to have a chat. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, very well. Uh, as we quickly just discussed off air, talking about the, uh, the the lockdown situation, how we're how we're handling that, um, things are opening up a bit more for you uh, than they are for me here. So I'm based in London in the UK, um, and at the moment gyms are still closed, but gyms are starting to open up uh, over the past few weeks for you, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. So gyms are uh, starting to open. Um, Different states have different regulations, but pretty much uh, every gym requires you to like make an appointment because they're only allowing so many people in. And it's starting to get pretty restricted back to restriction because some gyms are making you work out with a mask on, which is right. uh, probably going to be pretty difficult. Rep performance is definitely going to be down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of social distancing. Focus on your one rep maxes rather than your, your 20 rep maxes if you've got to have a mask on, right? Yeah, exactly. So I have clients complaining about that and like, I really don't know what to say besides better than no gym, right? So Very true, very true. Um, yeah, when you've been without a gym for sort of close on 15 weeks, uh, as, as it has been here, then uh, having to train with a mask doesn't seem like quite such a, such a sacrifice. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so one question I've got um, is, I'll maybe go through a few different scenarios of people, how they return to training and how they should be approaching that, but I suppose how that's informed um, your return to training will be largely informed by what you've been able to do uh, in lockdown. So maybe you can explain, first of all, like your personal experience, like what training have you been able to do? I'm fairly certain I've seen on Instagram, you actually have access to some, some decent equipment, right? So you're maybe not as bad off as some of your online clients are. Yeah, so uh, I'm blessed to have a pretty much a complete home gym. So I have like a Smith machine, barbell rack, cable machine, all, all adjustable, uh, adjustable dumbbells. So the all the weights go as high as I need. Um, I just don't have access to like luxury things that I might like, like, you know, hamstring curl, leg extension, uh, hack squat. Mm-hmm. But for people like me who have access to like adjustable weights where they can train uh, progressively and still maintain high load performance, I could see them going back to the gym and pretty much training the same. Maybe if they do like a new exercise, they might have to take it slow for like a week. But if you have, let's say like, you know, some people have a a barbell rack and, you know, barbell and they have the weights that go, go up to their one rep max, three rep max, five rep max. If they could still squat really heavy and when they get back to the gym and they have access to like cables and a hack squat, you know, they're still going to be good to go. They're not going to like be achy in their joints or anything like that. So it yeah. uh, should, tra- should be good and the, tr- the transfer should be good. Now, compare that to someone who uh, might only have access to bands or, or worse, some people don't have any equipment or they have like a few light dumbbells hanging around. Those people going back to the gym should definitely take it slow and be easy on themselves because if they expect to lift the one rep max or their five rep max that they were pre-COVID, they're probably going to injure themselves. So I think like the key takeaway there is obviously you've got to, rather than picking up where you left off, think about what am I doing now and what have I been able to do and how can I... Uh, transition and bridge that gap so for some like for example for yourself gyms open up you probably haven't got to make that many changes or 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 worry about managing things too much because you've been able to train pretty similarly to how you ordinarily would whereas like say someone who's just been doing body weight work dives in you know not only are they opening themselves up to injury but like some serious doms at the at the very least you may avoid injury but uh, you know squatting vaguely heavy for the first time when you haven't been able to do anything is gonna you know cripple you almost for a week you know i think you'll be limping around if people try and dive straight back in with with heavy challenging sets so do you think people should be leaving a few reps in the tank or should they be straight back in the gym crushing like max reps uh and, and hitting trying to you know trying to take everything to failure because that's the temp the reason I asked that question is I'm, I've seen lots of memes on, it, on Instagram and lots of ch- people I've chatted to and they're like, I can't wait till I'm in the gym. I'm going to absolutely crush it. 
but I think they might be setting themselves up for a few issues if they take that approach. Yeah, re really good that you brought that up because like the mindset we have is like, oh, I can't lift as heavy, so I'm just gonna take the sets of failure, add in drop sets, rest pause, uh, cluster set, myo sets, do all these uh, set extending techniques to try to match the stimulus because we can't lift as heavy. And that's probably a really bad idea because even though pre-COVID, uh, if you have access to like body weight, uh, dumbbells and bands, you were probably training pretty intensely, but the, the same intensity for a certain exercise uh, garners a different fatigue for a different exercise. So if you go back to the gym and now you are hack squatting, uh, barbell benching, barbell deadlifts, doing these other exercises that are more fatiguing, uh, that's not gonna be a good idea. So you're gonna accumulate a lot of fatigue and as you said, a lot of doms so probably leaving some reps in reserve is a good idea on top of that volume is probably important as well to manage fatigue and soreness so if you go back and you do the same volume you did pre-covid probably not a good idea either probably start with a, a lower amount of a set mm -hmm. yes that makes perfect sense so i think um again we've got that like everyone's on a different continuum between what they've been able to do and and, and uh whether they've been able to do nothing or whether they've been able to train normally so let's take the approach of someone who's uh, first of all who's basically been able to do nothing other than body weight work so they've realized that they still need to train to try and you know, uh, give a stimulus to maintain uh, size and strength the best they can, but they've been very limited. For them, like you said, um, coming back in and getting sore, it, even if you're doing a different exercise, even if you work in that muscle group, you'll get great soreness because it's a novel stimulus. But if you've literally been limited to body weight, like everything you do in the gym is going to be new and so you're going to get that terrible doms um i try to you know trying to think of it when you change programs people they're, they're on a program they'll be doing it for six weeks they're not getting so sore and then they just change one or two exercises and all of a sudden they, they're massively sore it's not because the new mm -hmm. program is way way better it's just you did something new um, and that's what uh, causes that disruption and that soreness and when you set fo foot back in the gym having had only your body weight every exercise you do is going to get you really sore and I think it's important to understand that so from a volume standpoint um, you'll be at lower volumes I was thinking um, and I don't know if you've done this with some of the clients you've had go back in adjusting frequency for a body part so whereas I would previously have most of my clients would be lifting uh, twice a week per, per muscle group for example um, I'm thinking when I first get them back in the gym, I might only have them training a muscle group once per week because I know that one, that first week when they go back, they're going to be so sore that if they try and hit it 48 hours or even 72 hours later, they'll, they'll still be really suffering. Have you manipulated things at all with uh, with your clients that are setting foot back in the gym in, in that respect at all? Uh, yeah, so I definitely have manipulated volume as I spoke to earlier. Uh, pretty much everyone, if they're doing body weight at home and they get back to the gym, we're going to do very little sets and uh, volume and frequency have they have like a they're intertwined per se people like to treat them as two different things but they're really very intertwined like if you manipulate frequency you're gonna you should be manipulating volume and if you man manipulate volume you should be uh, manipulating frequency so if we're lowering volume then uh, there's really no point in doing very high frequency anyways so like if I'm having you do uh, like let's say quads for uh, you know two sets per week just to get back into it because you know people obviously they want to barbell back squat they want to hack squat uh, they want to front squat so these are very fatiguing exercises that they're not accustomed to if we're going to do those i'm not going to have them do like you know five to ten sets per week if we're only doing like two or three sets of those there's no point in training that very frequently we might as well put it in the same workout yes so yeah frequency is likely going to go down for uh many people who uh, aren't accustomed to training at the gym yeah 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 that makes sense i'd agree with that i think um and, it, and it's only uh, the way i'm mapping it out for people that are getting back into them it's a short-term thing there's a the, that reduce a reduction in frequency is for two reasons first of all as i said that that soreness which will be almost at all-time highs because they're like a newbie again uh mm -hmm. the first time you went in and trained hard and you sort of were limping around after your first ever hard squat session for a week you, you might well be feeling that again because you've had three months out of the gym um, and then also as you say because total volume's down so uh there's no need to distribute it across the week in the in the fashion we normally do but i feel like just a few weeks like that, and then we'll be able to start transitioning. Uh, the DOMS is out of the window, it's not such a concern. The body's adapted that way, and then we can scale volume gradually uh, back up. So I, I, that's how I'm mapping it out. Like I say, for, for my clients over here, we're not back in the gym yet, so I haven't actually had any feedback from people. Have you, with some of your guys that they're, they're starting to get back at, 
into it? How's it been? What's their feedback been from training? Are, are they are people nervous to be back in the gym or are they just embracing it and they're, they're delighted to be back? Um, most of my clients are not nervous. Most of my clients are excited. Um, I think we tend to attract the people that are similar to us as far as clientele, like me. Like, uh, I'm not really that scared of like COVID and all these other things. Um, yeah, most of my clients are the same way. Uh, they're usually on the younger side too. Like none of them are near like elderly age per se. So they're not at a, at a huge risk. So most of them are excited to get back in the gym. So you kind of have to make sure their eagerness doesn't uh, like doesn't get them in trouble. So you have to program everything uh, very meticulously for them. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, my like think about my online clients is a bit of a mix um, in sort of the age range. And so I think there's a uh, there will be a different approach for or, or mentality from some of them. I know some of them are, they've managed to kit out their home gym now pretty well. They didn't have one before, but they, you know, like a few of us, certainly like I did, panic bought, got loads of equipment in. Now they've got a pretty nice uh, setup at home. They're in no rush. Uh, certainly the older the older clients, whereas the, the younger guys who are, you know, at lower risk, um, they they're itching to get back in the gym, so really chomping at the bit to get in there. And they're the ones where I think I'm going to have to to rein them back a bit because session one, as far as they're concerned, they're like going to go and you know absolutely blitz themselves and try and crush it. Um, and that will be that will be a different um, a different conversation, and you know actually trying to hold them back a little bit probably to which which will serve them long term. Yeah, I had something to add to this uh, mm -hmm. uh, to your question that you just asked me. Um, I also had a few clients who have reported because uh, uh, you have to schedule in advance. One, that's a good thing by the way, because it's it's getting less compliant clients to go to the gym more often because if you're scheduling it. It's like scheduling like a personal training session. You're, you're going to go there. It's, a, yeah. it's an appointment. The drawback to that, though, is some of my clients have been reporting that uh, when you make an appointment, you can only make an appointment for like an hour. And sometimes some of their workouts are like, you know, 70 minutes, maybe 75 minutes with a warm up. So another thing I had to adjust for is uh, I told them to warm up outside before they go in. OK, yes. Yeah, warm up outside so then they can use that 60 minutes just for lifting. Um, but even then, some people um, you know, really heavy exercises, a lot of plate loading, a lot of warm up sets inside the gym. They're still taking 70 ish minutes, 75 minutes. So we have to either uh, lower rest periods or lower volume. And that's kind of like a, a slippery scale of which one works better for certain people. Because if you lower rest periods, you maintain the same volume, but you are going to compromise rep and weight performance. And then if you, um, if you lower volume, you don't compromise rep and weight performance, but you get less volume. So it's like for some people you have to figure out which is going to work better for them yeah try and find that sweet spot between sort of qu quality and quantity is uh, too simplistic a way to approach it but but you know like finding that uh, that perfect threshold for them volume wise uh, managing the rest and getting getting the most productive training into those 60 minutes um, yeah which yeah it's actually a good point um you know thinking about the, the clients i used to see in person they could arrive early they could be warming up in the gym whilst um I, you know, i'm with a client and then as soon as we're ready they get 60 minutes of, of non-stop lifting but uh that's not necessarily going to be the case now and as you say so great tip for them to be warming up outside uh, a little advantage you have is the the climate in california compared to the weather we have in london <laughs> last few yeah. weeks it's been pretty good i look out the window now though and we've had like four seasons in one day today so rain and sun and all sorts so um maybe maybe that will be a little bit harder for them to, to do but a great tip i think to to be ready to go yeah. also you've got someone who's incredibly strong um exercise selection obviously is going to be an issue like you say if you've got someone who can deadlift uh five six hundred pounds um then most of their 60 minutes is going to be sent uh you know warming up to that one set and that's maybe not a productive use of time uh, or the most productive use of time and unless they you know have a deadlift competition or you know a powerlifting competition lined up um so i think picking exercises sensibly there um perhaps with assistant stuff so you know if you're back squatting you might actually be then leg, leg pressing and using the leg extension rather than trying to put the hack squat in as well where more warm-up sets are required yeah for sure um yeah i got nothing to add to that the exercise selection point um, I do have something to add, make it more tangible as, as opposed to just saying, oh, you probably have to shorten your rest or, uh, or, uh, or lower your volume, figure it out for yourself. Um, what we do know from the data is that people who are more endurance mm -hmm. uh, they tend 
tend to do better with shorter rest periods, or not do better, but they can get away with shorter rest periods. Yes. So like for me, I noticed that uh, females, uh, I'll be more inclined to shorten their rest periods because females are, their physiology is more endurancy than males. Like if you ever trained with a, with a gal, you'll notice that if you guys do the same set, you're like huffing and puffing and yeah. she's ready to go like right away. Um, on top of that, if you do a lot of cardio, so you naturally have a good work capacity, uh, you should probably lower rest periods as opposed to uh, reducing volume. Because if you reduce volume of an already low volume, you're just getting a lower dose of stimulus. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a, that's a good point. And it's a bit like, so some people, uh, you know, tend to do well, uh, they're more, more explosive or higher intensity training, but lower volume, and that really suits them. Whereas other people tend to work with higher rep ranges, higher overall volumes. And I suppose being aware of what's worked for you and your previous training history can inform the decision making there. Like you say, someone with a great work capacity is probably going to be able to handle a, a reduction in, in rest periods uh, and that will allow them still to get sufficient volume in. But if you're, if you're someone who's used to eight minute rest periods and only hitting three, <laughs> yeah. you know, three reps is cardio, you could be in trouble. Yeah, for sure. Totally. Know, you're going to have to get good at creating disguises to book in multiple times a day. <laughs> right? So, uh, <laughs> The the um, the other thing I was going to say actually with a bit of experience of people being back in the gyms over there is you know previously I'd use quite often exercise pairings so um, antagonistic supersets you know uh, alternating between one and the other to be you know quite uh, efficient time use uh, you know so you might bench press and uh, pull ups for example or um, something like that as a and you do a set of bench press rest do your pull ups rest and, and alternate between the two now from a practical standpoint how is it in terms of using multiple bits of kit, presumably they don't want you strolling around the gym using loads now. You, you want to be in one place as much as possible. Uh, has that been, uh, has, is that true? Is that what's happening? And has that been uh, a problem and you've had to, to, to address programming that way? Yeah, for sure. I, I've had some clients tell me that their gym doesn't allow for supersets now. So you can't, you can't pair between, you know, going from the rack to, uh, like a, a cable machine or something like that. Um, so for people like that, pretty much the tip is going to be simple. Uh, if you can't, if you're not, if you're legal, if you legally can't superset, uh, don't superset. <laughs> if you can superset though, um, very good at saving time, especially if you're doing a, a opposite movement pattern. So like you said, a push and a pull or like a, a hamstring and a quad exercise, you pair those together. And research has shown that that even enhances the effect it can. Um, outside of that, to save time, you can pair uh, upper body and lower body. Yeah. So not a lot of overlapping muscles there. You can do like a pull up, uh, pair that with like, like a, a squat or a leg extension, and that's going to definitely save you some time. Yeah, I think as a as a time saver, they're a great uh, a great tool, and I'm really really big fan of them. And then I suppose you just have to work out what are the practicalities in your gym and what's feasible. So uh, you may I don't know you may be able to get one bench and one set of dumbbells, and um, whereas we might not ordinarily like to be you know exactly certain rep ranges we're working in, that might mean that you're doing incline dumbbell bench and then chest supported rows with the uh, or you know prone rows on the, on the bench with those dumbbells and you know, maybe just take every set to two, two reps from failure and if that means you're doing sets of uh, 15 on one exercise and sets of 10 on another, don't stress that you're you know, you're not in the hypertrophy rep range or whatever. Uh, yeah. J just, you know, that's that's a way to get a productive workout in. Um, and, and I think we're going to, we're all going to, it's going to be a learning experience, learning to be a bit flexible and, and how we can, uh, can, can make the best of the situation. Yeah, for sure. I just, I encourage people if they can superset, definitely do it. Like you might get some looks from people because you're like switching between like, you know, the hack squat and the cable machine, you're walking back and forth but you know you're you're ultimately there for you so you got to get your workout in you got to get it uh get it productive mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent. so um we, we've talked about someone who's done nothing and like basically that any training is going to be new to them and they can probably reduce volume reduce intensity uh, relative intensity as well they don't need to be pushing close to failure so say we've got someone who's managed to get in the middle ground they've got a bench and they've got some dumbbells that are heavy-ish maybe they can press them for 20 reps but that's as that's as much as they've got maybe they've been able to find a, a bar to do some chin-ups uh, and why well, let's see they've been doing some split squats so they've been ticking over first of all that person should they be worried that they've lost muscle mass uh, absolutely not for sure no so losing losing muscle mass is quite difficult mm -hmm. um, you have to like not work out at all for like 
a week, two weeks, three weeks straight, depending on genetic and depending on other circumstances. So with someone with dumbbells that they can press for 20 reps, uh, that's plenty to even grow muscle. Like we know we can grow muscle from even higher than that. So 20 is, is, already, is already a good threshold to just maintain. Um, you can even grow if you can continue to push the, the overload by either adding uh, reps or uh, weight. And as far as other factors that affect muscle loss, uh, something that's very encouraging that um, is not, I wouldn't call it like conclusive in the literature, but there's a trend that points to this for sure, is that trained individuals are uh, less likely to lose muscle. So let's say you've been working out for you know years and years and you're obsessed with the gym. You've built that stimulus to build muscle and now, out of that entire time frame, you know, you're taking a few months off, which feels like agony, but it's really a short period in your whole training career. Yes. So during this period where at the very least, if you're doing, you know, uh, dumbbells and bands and you have a pull-up bar, just because you're not using a barbell doesn't mean you're going to you're gonna lose any muscle. Now, compare that to a person who, you know, has never worked out before. So that means um, they're probably catabolic throughout their entire life because human nature is not inherently anabolic without lifting. So even though it's very subtle, they've been continually catabolic. So that person, if they continue to not work out, they're probably going to, uh, you know, lose muscle exponentially. It's not huge if you're young, but as you get older, that curve gets really high of losing muscle. So um, most of the people watching here have probably worked out a little bit before COVID at the very least. So they probably have less to worry about. Uh, I completely agree. I think, um, so yeah, you're rewarded for your years of effort if you put them in here. Uh, so uh, muscles, you know, and strength, quite resistant to decay uh, as it were, or to, you know, to dropping off. Um, but if you're someone who just found the gym three more months before lockdown and you've made great progress for three months, sadly, the chances of you losing that progress are much greater than the guy who's had 15 years consistent training and just had to miss three months. Because as you say, in the grand scheme of that person's lifting career, this is just a blip, like a drop in the ocean. Um, and actually, I've been... Sp yeah, we all talk about the, the how clients have dealt with this. I've actually been pointing out to some people that this may be a really great opportunity for them because, you know, if you love the love training and you're um, such a fanatic for it, you never take deloads or you'll really, really avoid them. You know, people just love grinding away in the gym. They never take that time off. And actually having a bit of time away might be a real, uh, an opportunity for them. Let niggling, uh, niggling injuries um, heal up. And, and then the accumulated fatigue they've had from all those years of training sort of washes away a little bit. And they're basically, hopefully, resensitized a little bit to the stimulus of training, but also fresh and motivated you know, when the gyms reopen. Uh, is that something that you, any conversations similar to that you've had with any of your clients or even just you know, talking, sort of thinking it through yourself and how this applies to you? Yeah, especially uh, more advanced clients, uh, especially clients who are obsessed with specific gym equipment like the, the barbell, the leg press, the cables. Those clients worry like, oh, I'm going to lose strength and um, I'm going to lose all this muscle. And, you know, it's going to be really bad if I don't have access to that equipment. But uh, without access to that equipment, you have the opportunity to deload from those movements. And on top of that, during the break, if you... Uh, you know, reduce overall uh, overall workout. If you just train less, do less sets, you, like you said, you're basically deloading your body, not just to those movements, but just to overall fatigue. And there's probably been a lot of that in, in very advanced lifters who do these barbell movements and, you know, really heavy movements like leg pressing and hack squatting, uh, because the heavier the movement, the more stress there is on your, your joints and your connective tissue. So uh, what we know is that you know, even though your muscle per se might be recovered and you can continue to make progress through muscle hypertrophy and markers of muscle recovery, your uh, joints and connective tissue don't adapt at the same rate, uh, at least not always. So um, you never get, want to get to the point where you realize that your your joints and connective tissue don't adapt because, you know, with muscle, you might just get a drop in performance. You might just feel some soreness. But with joints and connective tissue, if you realize it too late, you're going to get injured mm. and that's going to set you way back and really the only key there's no like there's no like supplement you can take to make sure your your joints and connective tissue line up with your muscles there, there's just there's just not like as we age that just gets more difficult um so the only real way to do that is to eventually deload it's one of those things you have to eventually do whether it's uh auto regulated based on some markers or if it's uh like pre-planned like this where you say okay i'm gonna do it at this point 
even though I'm continuing to make progress because um, while I'm a big fan of, you know, just keep pushing it, keep pushing it, keep pushing it if you can, there has to be a point where you say, okay, I'm going to take a break to make sure everything's, you know, everything's clear because at some point it's like the stock market. You just keep pushing it, pushing it, eventually it, it crashes. Yeah, 100. Well, I really like that uh, stock market analogy as well. So I think you're, you're bang on point there. And one of the best ways to make progress long term is to stay injury free because you can mm -hmm. do continuous, progressive, overloading training for the long term. And, you know, getting injured is a real spanner in the works. You can't get bigger and stronger if you're not able to get in the gym and provide that stimulus. So um, one of the ways that I think people, the only way a lot of people deload is when they get an injury and their hands forced. Um, and now a global pandemic has perhaps forced their hands this way around. And, and, and three months is longer than we'd ideally want to deload, of course. But um, I think, you know, some time away for some of those really heavy um, barbell lifts for some people will be very, very good for them. And, and again, on that point you make about connective tissue not uh, adapting in quite the same way that, that muscles do, that's one of the reasons why sort of being strategic with your exercise rotation makes sense in your programming. So I think that's not, you can apply that lesson into your programming going forward for people that, um, what, you know, again, there's a sweet spot. You don't need to be changing your exercises every week, but some kind of rotation um, is probably a good thing rather than you know being married to I just squat bench and deadlift and nothing else yeah yeah I'm so glad you brought that up too because I feel like we're at a point where like you know probably five years ago we were the the fitness industry was like oh change every exercise all the time and we know that's terrible terrible programming because uh, you'll never get good at anything if you never get good at anything you'll never adapt and uh, actually get stronger and build muscle lose fat um, but now I feel like uh, we're at the point where it's getting to a point where we've kind of debunked that myth so hard that you hear people say like, oh, we got to find the exercise with the perfect resistance curve and all these other factors. And you got to stick only to these optimal exercises. And, you know, that's true in the in the research and everything. And, and I'm actually really big on the research. But there are some things you can't do in research, like injury management. It's very easy to say this is the optimal exercise. Just stick to this forever. Apply the optimal volume and apply overload over time. But uh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I feel like a lot of trainers are so set on that that they forget that, you know, while an exercise might be less optimal per se, um, you have to eventually rotate to it to manage injury because managing injury isn't something we can draw from the literature. We can't just get yeah. we can't just get a group of people and say like, okay, we're gonna push you in this group and not push you in this group and change your exercises in this group and not change your exercises in this group and see who gets injured first. Like, like no, like no board would would approve of that. So we have to we have to fill in the gaps with. Uh, with our practical experience. And it's definitely super practical to choose uh, suboptimal exercises. So yeah. you don't have to squat, you don't have to leg press forever. You can switch to other exercises that uh, might not be you know, the most stimulative, but will be what you need long term. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. Uh, I think you explained that really nicely. Um, and, and on that whole uh, continuum is, you know, the pendulum swings that, you know, we, we like the extremes, right? No one's interested in the middle ground, but, you know, either you changing everything or you're never changing anything. But somewhere in the middle, uh, common sense dictates that's probably where we should be. And then talking about research as well, uh, if, if hypertrophy is the goal, actually having some variety of muscles, to, you know, of, sorry, of exercises for a muscle group has it's indicated that that will be superior. For example, just squatting as opposed to doing a variety of quad uh, exercises, the, the variety seems to uh, induce more hypertrophy. Um, a perhaps a little bit different if you're just looking for your performance in your back squat because it's a skill specific uh, element but I think that's an important thing to consider and actually talk about skill one of the things I've found maybe managing again expectations for people is people are married to uh, the numbers they hit on their their key lifts so that mm -hmm. people tend to care more about the complex lifts um, so, so for example a squat rather than no one's that fussed about their leg extension uh, yeah one rep max right and if they are then they probably need to have a hard work you know talk to themselves but because of that there's a skill component to your squat there's a skill component to a deadlift if anyone's doing olympic lifting there's certainly a lot of skill involved in that um, there's even you know a skill to if you're a really good bench presser now one of the things i've had to explain to people is those exercises may have taken more of a hit than a machine-based chest press, a, le a cable fly, a leg extension, for example. Um, can you, you know, can you explain a little bit your thoughts around that? How we can manage that expectation? How we can build back up to 
getting those skill lifts back to where they were? So the, for starters, you definitely just have to, to tell the client that, yeah, these, these bigger, more complex lifts are going to take a bigger hit. So the reason for it is when you, when you produce force, you produce it through two ways. You produce it through your, um, your muscles. So the more muscle you have, the more potential force there is. And then on top of that, you produce it neurologically. So through your nervous system and neurologically, that's all skill, as you said. And it's funny because we, we describe these lifts as as kind of a uh, um as kind of like traits like we say this person is strong but really um the more correct term for for strength is is a skill so it's it's not a trait it's it's a, it's a feat per se so instead of saying this person is strong really we're we're saying this person has a strong bench press, AKA this person is very competent in the bench press. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't done those lifts in a while, especially if they have a high uh, skill, high neurological component to it, they're gonna take a, a bigger hit. Um, it, one application to that is going back to the muscle thing. Just because it takes a big hit doesn't mean you lost any muscle. It's just because you haven't practiced that movement in a while. Um, so that's from a muscle perspective. From the actual skill perspective, to get back to that, you just simply have to practice that movement um, again. So you have to focus on uh, on eventually doing that movement more. So you, it comes back to uh, prioritizing your your goals as well. There's something I have to talk to with clients a lot because everybody wants to do everything at once. Everybody wants to get jacked, lose fat, you know, be a, an Olympic power lifter, Olympic lifter, um, you know, be a model, do all these things. <laughs> yes. But you have to prioritize these things. So if you want, if you want to get the skill back faster, you probably have to lower your volume on other things that might be better for hypertrophy. So managing expectations and managing goals as well, because if you if you have the same goals as you did previously, you have to know that, um, like for most people, they want to get strong and they want to get jacked. You'll have to know that these avenues might take slower to get back to if you focus on both. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. I think one of the things uh, you touched on there is um, that you've perhaps got less skillful, you haven't got weaker, uh, is something for people to, to think about is that, you know, if, if their squat's taken, taken a hit, it's not because the muscles will make waist smaller or they have less force producing capacity, but they just, you're not able to display that capacity quite so well because you're a bit rusty. And, and then again, uh, what, I had a conversation with someone explaining how when I was a kid I used to play a bit of tennis and in the, the weather in the UK isn't that great so large chunks of the year I couldn't play the first time I went back I was rubbish but within a couple of weeks there was a really steep learning curve. like I got I improved at a dramatic rate just because I was relearning skills so regaining muscle relearning a skill is much faster than that you know, it took to build the muscle in the first place and to learn that skill initially so uh, people shouldn't panic and I think your your description was really helpful for people and um, you know makes perfect sense in that respect um, the the next thing I was going to, to say is maybe we can give some people some broad um, guidelines to go with uh, in terms of volume, intensity, proximity to failure, uh, those sort of things. So we'll take that, that middle ground person. They've been able to do some training, whatever equipment they've had, they've kept ticking over. Um, previously, they were training four or five days a week in the gym. When they, the gym reopens, do you think they should be diving back in at four or five times a week? Are you gonna scale things up? What, what would your guideline be there? Yeah, so if they're training four to five times a week before the gym was open, and uh, what would they be doing uh, so, so during COVID? So pre-lockdown, they trained five days a week. In lockdown, uh -huh. they've basically been able to do, um, they, they've kept taking over four sessions a week, but it's been uh, relatively light. They haven't got access to much equipment, but they've been pushing pretty hard. So they've gone close to failure. Everything's been sub 30 reps. Gotcha. Uh, so what I would recommend is whatever frequency you did during lockdown, I would start with that frequency. So if you did four times a week during lockdown, do four times a week when you return. Um, however, you want to lower volume and lower intensity. That makes sense. So uh, start with, uh, again, that whole taking yourself from where you are to where you want to get to. So with um, with your frequency, we're, we're doing uh, the same as you were in lockdown. Now, in terms of volume let's look so, so again we'll give some numbers for people to go off say pre-lockdown they were training each muscle group for about 16 sets per week for example so mm -hmm. uh, and it was split into two sessions so, so two two sessions of eight um, eight sets per muscle group they, with their four sessions uh, a week at the moment their volumes dropped down they're they're only doing eight total sets per body weight so they're, they're half the volume they were at pre-lockdown the gym's mm -hmm. reopened do they drive? Do you, they don't dive back in at 16 sets, but what, how do they how do they manage that transition? How would you suggest that? Gotcha. 
I would I would uh, keep the volume the same as lockdown if the exercises are the same. So give access to, to like good equipment. Yep. Then you can keep the volume the same and slowly ramp back up. Um, if not, if let's say you're doing like bands and some dumbbells, then I would lower the volume mm -hmm. because these exercises are going to be more fatiguing as we talked about. So you jump back into like barbell uh, squatting, uh, hack squatting, overhead presses, things like that. Um, you're going to have to lower the volume. So probably go from eight, I'd say uh, three to six. Yes. Okay, cool. So again, an example, yeah, everyone can do push-ups, right? So if someone's been doing 20 um, sets of push-ups per week, they don't need to go back in and hit 20 sets of bench presses when they, the gym reopens. No, yeah, that would not be a good idea for sure. It'd be pretty funny to see, actually, but... Uh, yeah, <laughs> just some guy using the bench press for like the entire hour. Well, I'll tell you what, joking aside, right, on a Monday, first day the gym's open, you've got 60 minutes, where is every guy going to be? He's gonna be? They're going to be fight to get to the bench press. And then, yeah. Presumably, there'll be someone stapled there that can't move because you're not allowed a spotter, uh, so they'll just be stuck. <laughs> they're, they're 60 minutes they'll be crushed under their previous map no one wants to help them exactly. you know, no one's going near them social distancing bro <laughs> <laughs> and then they just their, their first 60 minute workout was basically lying under a bar so I mean that sounds I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened somewhere yeah for sure <laughs> pretty good um, alright cool now proximity to failure I know we've talked about it a little bit people don't need to go back in and sm smash things to failure um, right off the bat but are you thinking you're going to manage people go really really cautious week one gradually scale that up how's your approach uh, and, and do you use reps in reserve with clients ordinarily and are you thinking of, and if not are you planning on using it going forward with this yeah so I definitely use it ordinarily uh, I think reps in reserve is, is really good it manages the the intensity of each set because without without intensity you get people who either just don't train hard like they train like a bajillion reps from failure and they don't realize it or you get people who you know train balls to the walls or, or ovaries to the walls for females um, and they just train super hard like they're going all the way to failure and they're doing like cheat reps afterwards and you need to really manage that so um, I definitely use it ordinarily going back to the gym during uh, this return after lockdown I would recommend you do from I recommend you start at about four reps in reserve so a little bit more conservative mm -hmm. four reps maybe three um, two is fine if you've already been used to training really hard with good equipment um, but again this the the one rep in reserve that you did with push-ups is not gonna feel the same with one rep in reserve that you're doing with you know a uh, barbell bench press for the same reps like like push-ups you do like a, let's say you do 30 reps if you do and you leave one rep in the tank if you do that with a bench press you're gonna feel really beat up so I recommend people be be pretty conservative to start so like four reps in reserve or three reps in reserve and then um, when they get when they start to get used to it and get less sore I would recommend uh, at, at least three three reps in reserve two reps in reserve one rep in reserve yeah, 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 yeah. I completely agree I think that makes perfect sense and um, it, there's a couple of interesting things I think about reps in reserve ordinarily like week to week re reps in reserve might reduce so you might have someone going three reps in reserve then next week is two then one and then they go to failure for example because they're adding weight each week but now um, uh, you know because they're relearning a skill you might be able to add weight and your RIR your reps in reserve doesn't change from week to week because the skill component outstrips the, uh, the sort of the muscle ad adaptation in that respect so um, you might find that you can go in and hit four reps in reserve and for the first month you can add weight to the bar each week and actually it's still four reps in reserve so I think that's going to be an interesting thing for people to get their head around certainly on uh, those complex moves that we talked about so, so that's one thing, uh, you know, your squats, you, you know, those sort of exercises, I think people really might see that, uh, that situation happening. And then the other thing um, with reps in reserve is that, as you said, like three, maybe four, being a bit more conservative with it, which I know a lot of people will be sort of be thinking to themselves, ah, oh, there's no way I'm training four reps in reserve, that's, that's not hard enough. But the whole threshold to training is way down here if you've not been in the gym and not been providing that stimulus. So you might as well take the easy games, like it's the low hanging fruit, get in, mm -hmm. get some you know, get get the get well, get the easy gains. I mean, it, it's not it's not a race to make this as hard as possible. It's not a uh, not competition to see who can suffer the most. It's yeah, you know, the whole point is to try and get some results, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's a good point because I think people base their they base their training on on feelings a lot. So they have to feel really hard. They have to feel like their their biceps are going to explode for for that set to count. But it's more what's more important than the feelings is the data. So if you go four reps in reserve and then the next week, like you said, you.
you can increase load and still maintain that intensity, that's great. That means that means you're fully recovered and you applied overload. So you know the muscle growth is eventually gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And because you have more recovery capacity, it's a safer bet and you could probably do more work elsewhere um, to get uh, to get more adaptations but the reverse has more risk as you as you mentioned so if you if you if you don't listen to this advice and you know you you just did dumbbells and bands during lockdown and you're dying to get to that leg press you get to the leg press machine and you go you know you go ham for like a, a 20 rep max um, even though you feel uh, you know you feel very accomplished it, it's there's more risk involved because now uh, you're accumulating a lot of fatigue and now if you get sore so people think like soreness is a uh, is a badge of honor um, and a little bit soreness is, is always fine but that excessive soreness what people don't realize is, is muscle breakdown so even if you get more overload if you get overload and you get additional muscle breakdown that kind of uh, cancels it is out it's kind of like if you if you spend, you know, you might be getting a few more reps. So just from four reps in reserve to failure, you might be, you know, making four extra dollars per se, but the muscle breakdown might be higher without you realizing. So it might just completely negate mm -hmm. those four extra reps, or it might be worse. You might be negating like five or six extra reps. So the former example that I gave of leaving uh, more reps in reserve, while well, the example you gave, you can still get overload and maintain that same intensity. That's really good because that's a much safer bet. You're getting overload with less fatigue, less muscle breakdown. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's a, I think there's a, you know, there's a cost to everything you do. Um, and as you say, that, that, that overload has to be managed with the, rec the recovery side of things. There's two, two point, uh, sides of the coin. It's a bit like, you know, if you get a pay rise of like $10,000 a year, but the, the office is way, way further away and your commute costs you $10,000. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really worth it. So uh, it's, exactly. it's, it's making that, that assessment with, with this as well. Um, yeah, which I think is a great point uh, that, that you made there. So definitely one. And, and I, you know, it's going to be hard. Like, let's be fair, people are going to want to get in and crush themselves. But the other thing I'm trying to tell people is they're actually almost holding themselves back because once they go in and do a few really, really hard sessions like that, the, the, <laughs> to keep overloading, well, you've only got one way to go. You need to keep training at that intensity, and sometimes um, to, to get the best, you know, for like the, you know, you have to do the hard things, right? And sometimes the hard thing is actually to take a step back, leave a little bit in reserve, and allow yourself to progress so you can have eight weeks of great training, not go in and train incredibly hard once and then be sore for the next week and and not be able to provide a stimulus. So to some extent it's having a bit of maturity about your training and seeing the bigger picture yeah like uh another component that we talked about earlier is injury management so the examples we gave here is assuming you don't get injured and so if you train really hard even if it might be even if you might get more muscle growth you know if you get if you're more likely to be injured that's not a good thing because injury is like killer if you get injured even if it's barely minor your training is just so much worse. Like anybody who's been injured knows this, that um, yeah, you just have to take weeks off or your training, you have to compromise on all these other variables even more in the future. You have to train with less intensity, choose uh, less stimulating exercises, um, do less volume and make all these adjustments that you don't want to make. So you might as well do the, the I guess, the, the prehab choice, the, the proactive choice, as opposed to having to react to an injury, which is much worse. Yeah, 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 that's a great point. Well, um, uh, you know, we're both coaches and this is a bit of a shameless plug but I think it's one of the reasons why having someone if you're not confident about this having someone to guide you having a, a coach will be you know invaluable to manage uh, the reopening and making sure you get the best out of the, the initial return to the gym but also you set yourself up with a really big runway and create that opportunity um, that window of opportunity to keep making gains for the future rather than sort of shooting yourself in the foot getting injured or doing too much too soon uh, and just sort of you know almost over training right off the bat which is a, a, a risk lots of people uh, I think are making and, and interestingly just before we came to call you were saying that your coaching had really picked up you know recently so it's great to see that people are reaching out and realizing you know they haven't had this situation before they haven't had three months without training what how should they navigate that return yeah for sure the the risk is not worth the reward and uh, a point i want to bring up is that even us coaches we have coaches like i have i've had and have currently coaches for like everything fitness uh, education uh business accountability just life a lot of things so um no one is ever too good to have a coach mm -hmm. yes 100 percent. and 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 also you know this is this is new for everyone so you want people that understand the principles because then you they're applying it to a new situation you know we haven't had to deal with the gym being shut for three or four months so there isn't a tried and tested protocol but if you if you have some principles in the the understanding and that's what good coaches have is 
uh, that, that understanding of the, the underlying principles, then they can apply that to the unique situation and get the most for the individual client. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Totally agree there. Um, so we mentioned people losing muscle. I just want to give a quick plug because on your website, Awesome Fitness Science, you had a really good article on, um, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but if gym, with gym shut right now, you're, are you losing muscle or something like that, right? So anyone that is concerned about the effects of time away from the gym, I uh, advise you to go check that out. It's a really good article and lots of research in that that you've, you've covered. So um, the, the science uh, is there. Um, and some studies, you know, people have had 32 weeks out of the gym and, and they did, the muscle just didn't fall off them there. So, so mm -hmm. if you want to put your mind at rest, if you're listening to this and you're not quite believing the fact that you haven't lost muscle, go and do that. Because the point I'm making here is I, I, I've spoken to some people and they feel like they've lost muscle just because they're not training. You haven't got, you haven't gone and got that, that pump and almost the, 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 mu the muscle tone you have from training regularly. The, the scales, they haven't really shifted too much. And from visual pictures, they don't look too different and, and their clothes are fitting the same. So there's this objective data that tells me your physique hasn't dramatically changed. You just maybe feel a little bit flat. It's almost, I mm -hmm. like when they go low carb, people have tried that and they, they feel a bit stringy and flat, but it's not like you've actually lost a ton of muscle. So your mind can play tricks on you a little bit. So you're, I think your article mm -hmm. will be really valuable for people uh, to check that out if they're worried. But also, have you, have you had some people coming to you like panicking uh, that they've they've lost muscle uh yeah all the time people even before covid like people go on vacation or uh yeah they they have a busy like week at work and they couldn't work out people always uh they, they always freak out about about muscle loss it's just one of those things like with, with everything like all like like sometimes i'll program cardio like it depends on the client but very infrequently but sometimes i'll do and they're like am i gonna lose muscle and just like little things like that or like they couldn't get in enough protein like they missed one day by like <laughs> 10 grams or something and they're like am i gonna lose muscle i'm like no you're not just just relax like uh yeah and uh you got the article spot on by the way it's called uh with gyms closed are you losing muscle okay cool so yeah definitely if you're wanting to if you're just interested check it out but if you are concerned about have i lost muscle and with what i've been able to do that will give you a really, really good insight into why the chances are that you have lost zero muscle um and um, yeah, actually, I was going to say about that point. Uh, with my long-serving clients, people I quite often put people in maintenance phases. Um, I don't call them that because that's not sexy, but it's like a primer <laughs> phase or a strength phase or whatever. And in those phases, it's lower volume. Uh, they tend to lift heavier, but um, it, we, we're trying to maintain size and strength, but reduce um, volume so they can recover. And I don't want the scale weight to change during that time. So uh, if they're doing it at the end of a bulking phase, their, their carbs have come down, they're at lower overall calories. So they're getting a bit less of a pump, doing less volume, and they don't get that satisfying at the end, you know, the mirror check, uh, they're not got such a pump. And I, this is the thing I overlooked and my mistake when I was first doing this, people were panicking. They're like, oh man, I'm doing this maintenance phase, I've lost loads of muscle, just because they weren't getting that visual feedback. Now, what I found is people that have been through that process, they were much better prepared to deal with this in terms of the visual um, situation when they're look in the mirror they're maybe not pumped up after they've done their their home workouts the guys that i hadn't put through a maintenance phase it's just like as a little anecdote they they were the ones that really they're the ones that came to me with all the questions and they were worried um so it's so just interesting there if you've been through the process or something similar you're better prepared um or if you've got someone to warn you this might happen that also helps yeah uh, I totally agree with that. There's uh, maintenance is one of those things where if you've never done it, your your reaction to it is, is much different. So like uh, with certain clients that they've done maintenance before, they're definitely much more prepared, uh, like you said. But with people who they've never done maintenance before, they they freak out about maintenance. Like uh, I have this more with dieters actually. So like people who who diet down mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually like they get into like a bunch of life stress or they need a deload. Um, and so it's best to go back to maintenance to uh, take a diet break. Um, they they can't handle it. They just they want to keep they want to keep losing weight. They're like, if I go to maintenance, will I gain fat? And yeah, the same yeah, thing yeah. with the the bulkers. If people are building muscle and they eventually go to maintenance for for deload, um, and you tell them, okay, we got to go to maintenance. We got to you know drop calories back down, drop volume, intensity, or both. And they're like, no, I don't want to do that because like you said, maintenance isn't sexy maintenance is like it feels like you're not making any progress it feels like you could be losing progress but it's uh it's like you said a primer phase is, is probably a, a better choice maybe a primer week instead of a deal calling it a deload um it's basically setting you up 
or more progress or continual progress. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it's um, it's it's a hard sell. I mean, I, yeah, I resisted it myself for, for ages, and it was only when I eventually did one and saw the benefits, I was like, oh, there's something to this, and uh, and sort of that got my buy-in. But um, I mean, I, I I took several years to learn that lesson when I, I should have done it much quicker. Um, so you're one hundred percent correct. And and then the other thing is, people think, oh, it's like one step back to take two steps forward. I don't think you even think it's that. I don't think you're taking a step back. I think it's, it's almost like a step sideways to take three steps forward so trying to, mm. trying to sell it to people uh, we'll get off a little maintenance tangent here but I think it's one of the most overlooked especially for people trying to improve their physique uh, overlooked components of a, of a structured training plan um, uh, you know and it's it's absolutely um, vital and I think really does get great results for people and as you say uh, you know whichever end of the spectrum you're on if you dieted down and you you told you go you can bring your calories up Undoubtedly, a vast majority of people are going to panic that they're immediately going to get fat overnight. And likewise, yeah. the 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 demographic I mostly work with, uh, guys that like they're typical hard gainers. When you tell them you're not eating a huge surplus anymore, that they're like, oh man, I'm just gonna I'm gonna be skinny. Like I'll wake up uh, like my 11 year old self tomorrow or something. So, <laughs> yeah, it's um yeah, it's it is it is what it is. It's, it is I suppose it's again that comes into the the art of coaching, trying to sell the thing. You know, you have to, to some extent be a, be a salesman and get people on board because you get buy in. They work harder, and one of the most important things is how how much effort someone puts into a plan, rather than if the plan is actually perfect. So you need to work to create that situation and get them excited. So yes, primer primer phases, um, and then what was it? Oh, deloads. Uh, I call, I started calling them intro weeks mm. because uh, well, yeah, because deload. No one likes a deload, so uh, it, it implies you're you're not doing the work, you're doing less, um, and, and you're going backwards. So yeah intro week the program this is anyone of my clients listening this that's uh, fallen for this trap they're going to be uh, be pissed off but it's like it's exactly the same as if it's a deload i just called it a different name so yeah right. yeah if uh no go, go oh, sorry i was gonna say if any of my clients are watching this um also know that um it's funny the the pushback i get from maintenance and, and deloading because uh uh my programming style i tend to do maintenance deload um those type of phases i do a much shorter than other coaches too, so I can't imagine what what other coaches do um, or or go through. But I tell you know I've told clients that we're gonna take a week to deload and we're gonna have to bring calories to maintenance and you know they're just freaking out because they feel like they're they're gonna lose progress. But um, you gotta understand it's like like you said it's gonna set you up for the future and it, it doesn't have to be that long. Yeah 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 yeah. Well I mean I had this week when someone went to a maintenance and um, uh, but they were from going up the other way so their carbs came down. And the scales drop because you know they're not storing so much water. So if, if you mm -hmm. store roughly three grams of water for every gram of carbohydrate, overnight their weight dropped a little bit. And I got this text message with their weight and should I bump calories up? And I was, <laughs> and, and the, the crazy thing is, I told them in advance like this is going to happen. But they just, you know, it, it, obviously it's an emotional thing changing your physique, right? So it's, maybe it's good that he did ask the question rather than he just did it. But yeah, it, it's so funny, um, you know, how it happens. But then I, I sort of been through the same process myself, so I, I recognise these things. I've I've panicked and made rash decisions. Um, and it's good to have someone to, to bounce these ideas back and forth off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. Um, we're sort of, you know, we use up a lot of your time. Don't want to don't keep you too long. So I've got a quick No, you're good. Um, where we're going to ask you uh, some either or questions so we can find out a little bit more about you and, uh, and, and, what, and what you like. So first Let's one. Let's do is, it. Is it pizza or burger? Burger. Uh, chocolate For or sure. peanut butter? Both. Oh, I can't choose. Yeah. <laughs> Probably chocolate. Chocolate's Probably more chocolate. versatile, but I love peanut butter a lot. I think that one's the one that most people sort of cop out and say both, or they just say, "Oh, yeah, like Reese's Reese's cups, right?" So <laughs> um, it's a nice little plug. We should get sponsorship from those guys. Um, okay, next one, holiday. Um, so this will be interesting: a beach holiday or a city break? Ooh, it's hard. I'll take city break because I already live by the beach. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. So I live like central London, right by uh, the River Thames. So I'm going beach holiday all day long. But uh, you, you, you have a beach by you, so no surprise that a city break appeals all right if you're having um, a steak is it rare or well done oh it has to be it has to be medium rare if you order anything other than medium rare you are blasphemous and your opinion about any food choices should not be warranted <laughs> I like that I like that okay uh, now eggs scrambled or poached uh, neither sunny side or over meat okay. or over over medium. Ah, oh, we've got a little, uh, a li little contrarian approach. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now can you tell uh, us something about yourself that people probably don't already know about you? Ooh, let's see here. Uh, this uh, this is a question that gets people thinking. Yeah, 
Uh, people uh, don't know about me. Let's see here. This is where we understand, like, we finally find out you like a budding concert pianist or something. Uh... Yeah. Um, for the most part, I put I put like a lot of my hobbies online, and um, you know, I talk about like like a lot of things. Um, but I think something that's very important to me that a lot of people don't know, at least not to the extent, is that uh, I'm a uh, very devout Christian. Mm -hmm. So I read my Bible every day. Um, I live by those principles. In fact, like a lot of these podcasts often ask me like, what's your favorite self-help book? And honestly, my favorite uh, personal development self-help book is the Bible. Whether you're spiritual, whether you're religious or have any faith or not, that book has a lot of wisdom that anyone can draw from. So I think that's a something about me that I think could help a lot of people. Okay, cool. All right, well, we're going to have a bonus question then. So you've given us your number one uh, self-help book. Let's get a couple of book recommendations off you. So, well, is there a number two self-help book or no? Number two, let's see here. Oh, uh, number two. And then... Okay, number your... two is... Okay, no, go ahead. If, you were, if you're thinking about that, also in the back of your mind, if you've got a training or a nutrition book or recommendation as well, we'll take that too. Gotcha. Okay, so number two self-help book, something that I really like uh, is called Atomic Habits. It's a very popular book. So yeah, um, James I know, yeah, James Clear. Many of my uh, friends and colleagues have read it, but I think that book is, is just very practical. And uh, if you can, if you can, do good habits and you can prevent bad habits so you optimize behavior then any goal you want doesn't become a question it just becomes inevitable it just mm -hmm. time becomes your asset at that point um i love that yeah, yeah. that's great cool As, i've heard great things about that but i've never read it so i'll have to add that to my list oh yeah read it it's good for sure okay cool uh, and then did yeah did you have a like a training and or a nutrition book that springs to mind that you think is a, a great read for people yeah um so this is where i'm going to be more of a contrarian again uh, as far as training and nutrition, I think book, I think like 99% of training and nutrition books are just absolute garbage. Like I think everything on the market is just like utterly trash, like either outdated or complete snakes oil salesman or just uh, like off on, on too many things that it's, it's not worth it. Um, so yeah, I think I don't recommend getting your training and nutrition knowledge from, from books. Uh, articles are, are better. Articles can be deceptive as well. And there's definitely a big pool, big percentage of uh, bad articles, but articles are always better. And if you really want to put in the work, learn how to uh, read, sci read scientific papers. So read the, read the raw data, yeah. uh, as I say it. Um, but I know most people, most people can't really do that because scientific papers are really boring. Like they don't have pictures. They're, they're not in a documentary. Uh, people think science are, are, is documentaries and YouTube videos, and it's not. Um, go on something like PubMed and find uh, scientific papers for like hypertrophy, fat loss, and learn to read a lot of those and how to decipher, um, how to how to read scientific papers per se. Uh, I'm probably gonna write an article on that eventually, but that would be the best source I would say for training and nutrition. And then if you want something, you know, more simple but still reliable, I would uh, read articles from uh, just from people like you know like Tom, myself. Um, if you're cool, I can name some other people yeah. that uh, I look up to in the industry. Uh, you know, uh, T Nation has some good articles. Uh, Eric Helms, Menno Henselman's uh, Renaissance Periodization, uh, places like that. You can find some uh, good training in nutrition. Yeah. But as far as books, don't don't ever buy a, an actual hard copy book. It's, uh, yeah, it's usually first. trash. No books. Yeah. Um, but if you want to know anything about nutrition, just watch Game Changers, the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, you're sold. Uh, job done. And um, yes, Eric Helms and Menno, uh, both guests on the show. Uh, we've Menno's podcast is live. Eric, we recorded a while back. It hasn't been launched yet or released yet, but we've had Eric on the show. Great guys. And um, Mike from Renaissance Periodization, with Periodization, easy for me to say, is someone else for, uh, we want to get on the show too. So some, I can definitely agree with those as some great recommendations. Yeah, um, and, and your articles as well. I don't know if you're still writing as much, but I remember... A couple of years ago, you used to write a lot, and I used to, to learn about a, a lot of stuff from your articles. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I do write, um, but not not so much as I used to. Uh, well, certainly not the last few months, like I was saying off air, uh, homes, homeschooling uh, has, has sort of taken over. While the kids have been off school, there hasn't been that many articles written, but I, I, get a, I try and get a few out. I quite enjoy doing it, so I need to try and get those out. Now, I've, uh, I, I reckon I knew what a couple of the recommendations would be for this next question, but I've, uh, we've, already, uh, we've already covered a few of them. So who should I interview next? Oh, okay. So let's see. Who should you interview next? Okay. Um, uh, is it okay if they're uh, not like a huge big name? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Gotcha. So there's this coach that I, I work with. Um, we run multiple 
uh, group coaching programs for females, for women. Mm -hmm. um, and she's very big on, you know, uh, recompositioning for women, per se. Um, so uh, we focus on a lot of fat loss and muscle building for, for women. And her name is Adele Frizzell. Mm -hmm. And I would interview her about the HCG diet. It's a diet that has a lot of controversy, yes. like a ton of controversy. Um, and before I started working with her, I used to think that too, because a lot of the evidence-based practitioners that um, that I look up to, you know, they'd make posts about like the, the HCG diet is, is BS, it's crap and all this other stuff. Um, but you know, as a coach that like science is only like a small part of the equation. Like practical coaching is a, is a big part as well. And especially with science, a lot of people, you know, can misinterpret things as well. So I actually looked more into the science of it. And on top of that, I've never met anyone who's had as much experience with this diet as her. She's coached so many rounds of many groups of women with this diet. And um, and she's, she's also written a book on it. It's a little... Uh, outdated. She's updated some of her views, but she's someone that's very evidence-based, but also very practical about this diet. And I would interview her. Her name's Adele Frizzell, and she'll tell you all the myths around it, all the things she's not sure of, because um, there's a lot of bold claims about the diet. But she will tell you all the great results that she's gotten with it, and she can answer a lot of questions about the HCG diet. It's basically like a, a crash diet of sorts, a, a way to lose fat really fast. And she does it in a way where she transitions people to make it more sustainable, but still achieve achieve those results that you wouldn't otherwise get okay interesting yeah so a rapid a rapid fat loss diet okay cool well i might yeah. have to get if you uh the, her contact details to try and get her on the show from you so uh we'll, 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 we'll definitely set that up all right for uh, sure man so now before you go please take a moment uh, to tell everyone where they can find out more about you uh what what you know services you offer what information you put out there yeah so they can find me at uh, awesomefitnessscience.com um that's pretty much my handle for everything um instagram youtube uh at Awesome Fitness Science and then my website, awesomefitnessscience.com. I pretty much post on all three of those platforms pretty consistently, so you guys can catch me there. All right, well, make sure the links are there for everyone to go check out. And like I say, um, Kevin has some incredible articles on his website, so I can vouch for those. Go over and check out those. Really, if you're interested in knowing the science behind things and how you can apply that, I think it's a great, uh, a great place to go. So if, if that's something you're interested in, go check out Awesome Fitness Science. All right, Kevin, thanks so much for your time. Um, have a great day and uh, I'll speak to you soon thank you so much Tom that wraps up today's episode thank you so much for investing your time with us we really appreciate it if you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now subscribing to the show and leaving a review positive reviews you know like five stars hint hint really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K on Instagram. Bye for now and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast.